Hello. <laughs> I can't hear you, Jenny, sorry. Can't hear you, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Zoom classic. <laughs> okay, sorry about this everyone. We've got a slight, slight problem with Jenny's sound. Um, bear with us one second while we try and resolve it. I think she's going to log back in. Okay. Sorry, Emily, I won't. I won't leave you sitting there on your own. Well, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> How are you doing? How's things doing where great. you are? Doing right. great, thank you. Great. Well, I welcome everyone to the to the chat tonight. It's not it's not gone off to the best of starts. You're not supposed to have actually seen my face. Um, it's just supposed to have been Jenny and Emily talking. So apologies for that. But um, hopefully, Jenny will rejoin us very shortly and uh, we can crack on with things. Here she is again. Still got issues with her sound. Can you hear us, Jenny? Oh my gosh, it's working. Here we go. Yes. Oh <laughs> I came straight from the Zoom call. It's just like, you have to reboot the whole thing. I'll, Hi. I'll disappear. Hello. <laughs> Happy Women's Day. I can't use technology. Yeah. <laughs> How are you, Emily? Great. Thank you. Great. Good to see your smiley face. <laughs> yeah. How's um? How are you? I'm well, thanks. I'm in Squamish, BC, right now. We've actually got sun for the first time in like two weeks. Amazing. So, where are you right now? Uh, so I'm in Devon, right on the border with Cornwall, and it is pitch black outside. <laughs> I know. Yeah, time zones are fun. Mm. So tell me how you've been coping this year what have you been up to so far I know that you got big mountain plans around the corner but how have you been preparing and keeping yourself sane and keeping yourself Emily um so I'm quite lucky that I live pretty close to Dartmoor so I can just you know my local walks involve getting straight out on the hills um so that's been a relief really I don't know how I would have managed if I was living like in a flat or somewhere like that. I know. And are you actively training at the moment or are you just, is it just kind of part of your lifestyle? Yeah, not really. I'm, um, I'm not really good at training for things, to be honest. Like, I know that you're supposed to, but I've never been very good at actually like making a plan and going for the plan. <laughs> uh, I don't know about yeah. you. Do you, do you no, I'm, I'm the exact same like running is a pillar of my life if I didn't do it I wouldn't be a person worth being around trust me <laughs> so yeah and I'm just and I'm really lazy and I know that doesn't make sense for the stuff that I do but I am just really lazy like if I didn't like running I think the stuff that I do would actually be inspiring because I would find it really hard but actually like like I just really want to go running in really long distances it's just what I do for fun so no I don't do a training plan Maybe now that I'm in my 30s, I should start thinking about that kind of stuff and like taking care of my body. But yeah, no, I, I don't. I mean, so I want to I want to get straight into it with your Spanish 3000s because I I do have a lot of questions about that adventure. 
But okay. just for people who are listening, do you want to introduce us to that trip journey? Sure. So in August last year, which feels like a complete lifetime ago, um, I spent a week in the Sierra Nevada mountains in Spain and tried to get a Guinness World Record. So I, I set out trying to do 25 mountains above 3000 meters in a week, ended up only doing 13, but that was still almost double the record. So win-win I guess <laughs> that's so cool and how like when you came up with this idea did you already know that there was a world record um to be had no or this is just what Emily wants to do for fun yeah so I kind of it seems so weird now having had the year that we've had but if you imagine in November 2019 I was sitting around thinking what can I do with my annual leave what might be fun to do with my annual leave <laughs> And I thought, oh, it might be quite fun to do a Guinness World Record. I wonder if that's even possible. So that's when I started looking into it. And then because of things like how long your annual leave is, I thought I have to pick something that's quite short. And I have to pick something either to do with mountains or cycling, because those are the kind of things I'm, I'm all right at. <laughs> um, and then it just kind of developed from there, really. I started looking for things and then I found the 3000 meter mountains one and thought, ah, I could probably have a crack at that. And then it was a case of finding the mountains, right? Because if I was gonna do it on my own, I needed to find something that wasn't too technical, didn't have snow in the summer, that kind of thing. And it all sort of grew from there. So when I first set out on my biggest ever world first, the run across Kyrgyzstan, it was really funny when I started telling people I was going to do it, people said things to me like, but you know what, even if you fail, it'll be a really great story to learn something. And I'd be like, oh, thanks. So did you feel comfortable? Like, did you tell everyone in your circle that you were going to do this? And what did people think? And how did, what questions did people ask? What weird things did people say to you when you were like, I'm going to go set this world record in Spain? So to be 100% honest, I didn't tell anyone it was a world record until afterwards. Oh, I like it. Because I thought by saying it was, everyone's panic levels would just do this. Yeah. Um, so I thought, if no oh, one's done it, then why do you get to be the one that does it? Exactly, right? Somehow by it, it being impossible, it makes it so much more of a big deal. Yeah. Whereas actually, if I just told people it was me going on a trip in the mountains for a week, that seemed so much more reasonable so now oh, so you I, were just it, off on a hiking holiday yeah it was <laughs> like, oh, a really walking. grim grim <laughs> hiking holiday <laughs> and did you camp out the entire time in yeah your, so in your was, bivy setup? yeah no I actually have a tent I'm um, I'm new to bivying Jenny you'll have to tell me how it all works I've only ever been once but um you just lie down and sleep wherever you are that's all it is <laughs> but what Stand is the <laughs> Yeah, on your face. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So no, I, I brought a really lightweight tent um, and I camped out every night uh, in the mountains, which was great. I learned a few things about the mountains up there in Spain. It was very, very windy. Um, oh. So I learned fairly quickly where to and where not to pitch my tent. And because it's all very rocky up there, you have to sort of pin things out with rocks rather than tent pegs. And oh, I hate that. Yeah, but it was it was really stunning. I'm really glad I did get to camp out there. And I don't know if it was because of because of everything, but it was very, very empty in the mountains. So I really felt like I was completely on my own for several days. Did you like that or was it intimidating? Oh, I love that, actually. I feel much more comfortable completely alone in the mountains than I do in like a city. Bizarre. That's it. So five minutes ago, I was on a Q&A and a woman asked me a question about the most dangerous country I'd ever been to and the most dangerous place I've ever run. I think she wanted me to give her some gnarly country that she'd have to look up on a map. And, and, and I was really stunned by that question because, of course, for us as women who go into the hills by ourselves, we've been told since, I mean, for me, since I was a teenager, not to do this stuff at night, not to do it alone, not to, you know, there are all these steps that I had to take. So I was really stumped by the question because no matter where you are, even if you leave from your front door as a woman, you are thinking about safety. So that doesn't change when you're abroad. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, do yeah, like do you have that kind of same sense, or when you go abroad, are you a little bit more like, oh, 
more nervous about this? I think, I think it depends. It depends completely on where you are, doesn't it? Because like in the mountains, you've got all different sorts of risks and it's sort of being aware of the risks and just like managing them, I suppose. As, as it You're happens. more in control of them, aren't you? Yeah, try or at least trying to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we do have a question from the audience of how long did this 3000 strips take you? So I had seven days to do it and that was part of the record conditions. So I, so it's seven consecutive days worth of time, right? So I, I actually took eight days, but only started when I got wow. up into the mountains and then did my seven days and walked back down again very slowly afterwards. I was gonna say, if you didn't train for that, that's pretty mega. Oh, but mate, I, I was going so slowly and I had so much kit because you have to do all this, um, like record keeping, not record keeping, like um, witnessing and like recording and altimeters and all, all sorts of stuff for the, to actually officially get the world record. So I was very heavily laden with stuff. I felt like a tortoise most of the time. <laughs> That's a spirit animal I go for when I'm running as well. I've got like this big backpack and I know I'm going really slow and I look ridiculous. Like I'm telling myself this is a run, but like the reality is. You feel so like, when I've seen your videos, you, you look like you're going for it. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel that way. And to be fair, I know that the camera's on. So oh, okay. <laughs> also that element. <laughs> There's a time between the cameras where you're like, oh, <laughs> just let this go a little bit. Yeah. Um, so do you want to talk briefly about what your kit was for this? Because I think you are a bit, you do know your gear and you've tried it all. So you obviously did pick the right stuff for this trip. What was your... What was your kit set up? Was there anything you would have done differently if you did this again? Are you going to do this again? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so I had a I had a sixty liter rucksack. Um, a lot of a lot of the kit I brought is actually just the kit I have. Really, I was trying to go as lightweight as I could, but lightweight stuff is really expensive. So I was really just working with what I had and what I could get. Um, I was trying out some. So a lightweight tent and a lightweight sleeping mat for X bed. Um, and I really absolutely loved the sleeping mat. Would that's, that's my go-to now. Um, yeah. But otherwise, I mean, most of the weight was food probably. Yeah. Um, Cause you, you know, you have to be self-sufficient. Um, my stove broke <laughs> halfway around. So mm -hmm. I was, I had dehydrated meals. So I was having to put cold water in and sit there for ages, Thanks waiting ages. for them to sort of rehydrate. Oh, that's um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to give you all my entire kit list because that'd be pretty boring, but that's <laughs> standard fine. hiking stuff, um, really. I have actually seen a lot of people who do ultralight because obviously I've researched the bejesus out of ultralight to be able to run with a backpack. Mm -hmm. um, but true ultralight, folks go without a stove and mm. they just say like you know yeah you just leave your stuff to soak for eight hours and then your food's ready to eat and I'm always just looking at this like why would you go that kind of distance without any coffee I just like <laughs> this is meant to be fun isn't this like what we do for pleasure I just I'll never understand and also I do think a stove is a really good safety feature you know if you do get rained on or you fall in a river crossing or whatever happens that you've got hypothermia you know, your stove is your best shot. It's the best way to sterilize water out of all the methods. Um, yeah, I'm a really big fan of a stove. I'm gutted for you that yours broke. Yeah, it was kind of a classic. But I don't understand how people who don't take stoves survive waiting for their dinner to rehydrate because I, I have to sit there and like eat biscuits while I wait for it to cook. Did you just stare at it? Is it like that proverbial watching the kettle boil thing, except probably, yeah. I'm bad with that with real stoves, <laughs> never mind <laughs> in the mountains. Yeah, I know what you mean. So, when I was reading about you, I think there's a word that comes up a lot, and that's bravery and mm -hmm. being brave. Um, how do you feel about the use of that term? I mean, it's Women's Day, so you can put it in the context of you are this professionally brave woman who is a role model for a lot of people and what it means to be brave. Um, I'm just leaving that as a really open, not even a question, just letting you talk to us about your bravery. Yeah. So brave started to bother me really, because I would, I would go places 
particularly on my own and people would come up to me and be like oh you're so brave for doing this and I'd be like oh that's odd I don't feel brave you know I'm just this is just me doing my thing like I for, particularly one thing that comes to mind is a couple of years ago I climbed Mount Treglav in Slovenia on my own um, and it's a it's sort of a, a via ferrata route um, to the top and I was I was going up it it had snowed a little bit um because it was the beginning of November and I was going up behind a chap who was doing it in trainers with a bike helmet on and I know right and and I was there fully kitted out properly and I was the one that everyone was stopping and saying oh that's really brave of you oh where are your friends and I was just like what's why you know I, I this isn't brave this is just me doing me yeah um I mean, surely you must have been have been called brave as well. How do you feel about all that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it is a really funny one, and you get asked all the time, "Aren't you afraid?" and and that was one that I came up a lot in Bolivia. I always got asked by the locals, "Aren't you afraid? Aren't you afraid?" and and the truth was, that I was I was deathly afraid. Like I was having a really hard time. So I was running across the Bolivian Andes, never been done before. There was no route, and and I was super, super scared. The weather was terrible. So I was getting hit by these thunderstorms at 5,000 meters altitude. So that's not a place that you want a thunderstorm. Um, the attitudes towards gringas are really negative. Um, there's a huge coca smuggling route. Like there was just, there was a lot to be afraid of. It's one of the most violent countries against women in the whole world. And you know, I just had all this stuff flowing in my mind. I always get asked, aren't you afraid? Aren't you afraid? And I think for women like you and I in our careers, um, I think we're kind of expected to stand up on stages and say things about being fearless because that's what our male colleagues kind of do. And, um, and I've just always really taken issue with that because of course I'm afraid and I don't think that's inappropriate. I think, you know, fear is a really important thing that your human brain does to keep you out of danger. It's why your legs wobble when you're close to a cliff edge because you could genuinely get hurt. So I think when people ask me if I'm afraid, I'm always like, yeah, but I can deal with it or I can have courage or but like there's no denying that there's fear there's no sense in being fearless um so yeah I do think it's really funny that you get asked that all the time I think that being told that I'm brave I mean I've been told that in my hometown I've been told that I was brave for going for a jog and I was like mm. huh? <laughs> yeah it is yeah it's it's hilarious the perceptions of of um what we must go through as girls being able to leave the front door sometimes yeah like I feel like you have to deserve brave and that you have to do something big and completely out of your comfort zone to, to deserve brave and a lot of the time when I'm being called brave it doesn't feel like that at all um but you're right about fear like there's definitely a a useful sort of a fear right the one that keeps you safe and alive um, and we don't want to be getting rid of that but then there's the irrational fear there's that rustle outside your tent that keeps you up. At, I mean, it still keeps me up at night and I've been camping since I was a baby mm -hmm. and still like just get those irrational fears in your head. And the more exhausted that you get, the more mountains you climb in a week. <laughs> <laughs> like I just, I really do get them and I have to battle them. So what do you, if you're going along and you're completely alone and isolated in the mountains and you're thinking to yourself, I don't feel brave right now. What do you do to harness that and keep going even if, things are going tits up, it started to rain or your stove's broken or? Um, I have this rational voice in my head, right? I, this might sound completely strange, but when I get to the stage where I'm quite exhausted and things are maybe starting to go not very right, I have this, this other me in the back of my head that starts telling me what to do. <laughs> if that makes sense like the you know oh, when you I have get that I'm so glad you said that because like because I've explained this and then people are looking at me like oh sh she talks to herself like she's got voices in her head but that's what it is I have yeah. I call it my, the expedition buddy I wish I'd brought on my trip and like she's the good adult that comes in and goes like you know that blister's only going to get bigger and you should stop and do something about it yeah I, I have yeah that. and like yeah. having you know saying to yourself like noticing that when things are starting to go wrong and having the voice in the back of your head saying hang on a minute you should stop and eat some food now the reason you're so tired is because you haven't eaten anything or you know you get into camp and you're too exhausted to put your tent up 
but there's the voice in your head saying no hang on you should do this now because if you sit down now you're never going to do it and it's going to be really cold tonight that kind of thing i'm so pleased i do the exact same thing <laughs> people yeah, are always really funny but now i've got crazy. someone <laughs> yeah full on two of us um, I'm going to turn us to some audience questions because we do have a few. Uh, one for both of us. Um, how do you decide on the gear you use? Um, do you always go as light as possible? And second part of that question is the heaviest piece of kit that you have carried. So I will let you go first. Okay. How do you decide on the gear you use? And what's your heaviest bulk in your pack? Okay. So how do I decide what I use? Honestly, a lot of it is just what I have seriously like I've so I do quite a bit of outdoor activities but I wouldn't say I have several like copies or versions of everything so it, it's kind of balancing it between being able to afford nice Gucci gear and just going really you don't want to have to wait forever to be able to have the right perfect kit you kind of just have to go sometimes um, and the heaviest thing um probably camera related things oh, that's good. um but you know would i would normally take i've i've actually carried a christmas tree up a hill once before but that's a very long story and it wasn't on an was expedition it <laughs> uh it was for new years actually but yeah <laughs> you, went, you went to be taking the trees down then don't we? Uh, yeah it was it's a very long silly story but that was probably the heaviest thing but you know that's not normal. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, so for me, yeah, you're always kind of between that. There's comfort and safety, and then there's being really light. I mean, the lighter your kit is, the further you can go. And the further you can go is actually a safety feature as well, because it means that you can get out on time. Um, so I do like pushing it with my ultralight and getting rid of comfort. And that's kind of because I go, if I'm, if I'm on a solo trip, I go at a level where I'm not actually spending time at the campsite. So I don't need a folding chair and all that stuff. You know, I am just going to sleep in a bivy. Um, I usually bring a tarp. My tarp is like this big when it's folded up and that's if it does rain or whatever, I do actually have some hope. Um, so yeah, I, I do push it really hard on the ultralight, um, but I never cross my line of safety. Like I always know that if the weather changes, I mean, especially that I do mountain trips and you know, in the mountains, you can have every season in a day. It doesn't matter what time of year it is. You could get snowed on and you have to be prepared for that. And if like, I will never, ever, I will die before I'm the mountain rescue case that wasn't wearing the right jacket. Like that's just, you know, here in BC, we get that all the time. People go out in a cotton t-shirt and then a snowstorm comes in the middle of July and, yeah. and they need rescued. And, and that for me is just, unacceptable so as light as possible but never crossing the safety line yeah seems a good good idea really we have got a question here about how do you stay motivated to train and since we're both kind of like anti-training programs this could be a disappointing <laughs> answer for everyone yeah. i mean it's a good idea to have a real reason behind the thing you're doing right i suppose in that sense motivation I don't know if it motivates me to go out and physically make a training plan, but you know, having really wanting to achieve the thing can help, I suppose. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of the same that I know I get so much pleasure from these journeys, and I'll have a lot more pleasure if I'm not crying in pain while I'm doing them. Um, and I really like living my lifestyle in a way that if someone's just like, hey, do you want to try that really big round on those mountains today? Or like, do you want to do it this weekend? That like, my legs are just ready to go. Like, I love keeping myself at a level that I can pretty much always take the opportunity if the weather's really good and there's a window to go out and do fun stuff. I mean, this is partially pre-lockdown world where like there could be spur of the moment adventures. But mm -hmm. that, that for me is the biggest motivation that I know that if I'm always healthy, then I always have access and I don't want to be at a point where I can't get up into the mountains whenever yeah. it strikes my fancy to be able to run up a mountain. Yeah, I think I've heard someone describe it as training for life. Like you don't have anything in particular in mind. You just want to be ready yeah. when it comes. Yeah, totally. I love that. It just, mm. it feels good to be healthy and strong. And yeah, we've got a question that I really love. It's going to be a big question. 
Okay. What are the best and worst aspects of solo adventuring for each of you? Oh, that is a big question. Good one, isn't it? Um, so some of the best things, I think, I find it far less complicated going alone because as lovely as other people are, the more people you add to a trip, the more complicated it gets and harder to organize and just there are too many if you want to go fast go alone that's how the phrase goes yeah exactly um so there's a lot of freedom by going solo and you can also change things without like at the drop of a hat if you need to um a bad thing i suppose well maybe not bad but just you know when you see people doing like these fkts and big supported events when you're going alone, you can't push yourself to that level. You've always got to have this like 20% yeah. just in case something goes wrong and then you're able to deal with it because you've got no one else to catch you. And I find that sometimes on long, particularly exhausting solo expeditions where you, you, I just wanted someone else to be able to just navigate for just an hour so that so I can stop pacing in my head, you know, just, just someone else to take the reins for a little bit. So that can be yeah. quite exhausting, negative about going solo. Um, I started going solo when I was quite young. Um, like I guess my biggest trip, I was 21, but I, you know, I started with smaller trips when I was younger than that. But I remember when I went out for my first, it was a bike trip and I was 21. I decided to cycle to the Yukon and I didn't know how to cycle. I didn't know how to fix a bike. Um, and the biggest thing for me was when I first got out of phone signal, and the bike did break and I was in remote northern Alberta where like you can't go to a, the next train station and go home like it's just you know you're in northern Alberta um, and realizing that I was like the only one around that could fix these problems I couldn't even phone my dad and ask him how to fix the bike because I didn't have phone signal I'm in the, yeah. the Canadian wilderness it's the most hopeless place in the world um, and I realized it was the first time in my life my whole life <laughs> that I'd ever been that alone that I actually did have to fix. I mean, up until then, your parents have given you exercises where you pretend that you're the adults and they're not going to help you. But really, if things go badly, you can always call them. Mm -hmm. And then for the first time, a 21-year-old girl, like I actually had to take full responsibility for myself. And it was really scary. And there were totally tears as I figured out how to fix my bike. But then I did it. And I always will now just hold on to that being like a really empowering experience that I would give that advice to all young people, especially is to go on a solo adventure and maybe it doesn't have to be that scary, but like get to a place where you're fully responsible for yourself and you're completely in the driver's seat. No one else is make, calling the shots. You can decide everything and you can fix everything. And I just think that's the most empowering thing to go through. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that for me was always the really good thing about solo adventures was that there's no other exercise like that in your life where you're just fully in control and fully responsible. And it's so intimidating, um, yeah. but feels really good if you survive. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. It's so empowering. Once you've got through that, you know, yeah, you've got this trust in yourself. Well. Yeah, exactly. And, and especially as a woman in my early 20s, that was really important for me to build that confidence because... Yeah, I never had it up until then. People had always helped me fix my stuff up yeah. until then. Yeah. And I think I still would if I'd never put myself in those positions. <laughs> um, bad thing. Yeah, I guess it's kind of similar to you that there, there isn't anyone else there to catch you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that does mean that you just have to be double responsible at all times. Like you have to take your safety way more seriously. Like you said, you have to have that reserve of energy um, you have to be ready to self-rescue at all times. You have to, you have to be the only adult in the room. And, and yeah, of course that's, that's a really intimidating thing. Um, sometimes when the task is really daunting or when you're not doing so well, either you're in a bad mood or you have actually hurt yourself or broken your bike, whatever it is. Yeah. There are just those moments where you just like, I just wish it's almost like wish, wishing for a rescue, which is the worst thing for a woman to say, like you just wish that someone would come along and fix this right now. Yeah, um, just a teammate. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I just yeah. need someone to talk through this problem with, at least. Yeah. yeah. Do you find um, you do that with the um the camera sometimes? I found occasionally if I get in a, a 
as well not quite dangerous spot but a bit of a spot i'll get the camera out and explain what's going on and somehow that makes it make sense when you're explaining it to someone else yeah it is a bit of the wilson and then sometimes you can hear yourself say your problems out loud and just realize that your problems aren't very real yeah like I think I was once complaining about my my bike. I w- I'd really hurt myself because I my one of my clip pedals came loose and and was twisted and and I just I listened to myself complaining or not even complaining, just like saying this is the situation and just realizing like these problems are just not even interesting. Like just my knee hurts a little bit. Like and I and I just heard myself and I just thought right these this is a total solvable thing and just saying it out loud just made me realize that I was taking something that wasn't super important or interesting and just because it was the only thing I had going on at the time you know I'm just out in the wilderness and I just blew it up as this big event when really like it was fine so the camera does yeah it is that kind of Wilson that you chat things out with and yeah and then go right okay actually I can fix that now that I've heard myself say it I can I can sort this out yeah. And that's well, someone yeah. to share it with as well, isn't it? Like, exactly, yeah. Or you hear yourself say things that just sound completely ridiculous. And you're like, actually, no, that's completely ridiculous. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something sensible instead. <laughs> do you have any good examples? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, so what I'm thinking of is when I was doing, I did an All the Tours challenge a few cool. years ago, going to All the Tours on Dartmoor in one go. And I was, I had a day where it was so foggy that I was having to do bearings and pacings to just find the tours. And I really wasn't expecting that. And I was, I, I came across a tour that was quite near another tour and had decided in my head that it was like the opposite to the tour I thought it was because I recognized a hollow in the rock that I thought I'd sat in like the Christmas before and made mulled wine. And I said this out loud and was like, what? <laughs> what? you just followed a bearing here Emily like it's most likely not the thing you think <laughs> that's so funny yeah bizarre so uh, that leads really well into the next audience question we have which is about navigation I'm wondering whether you and I both just grew up with navigation that we had a lot of practice or if we had to learn uh you you go first yeah I so I'm very old school with navigation I completely have no idea how to use a GPS, but love a map and map and compass. Um, And I can't really remember learning the basics of navigation. But like on, I did my mountain leader training when I was in first year at uni. And that completely like blew my mind about how micronav works. And since then, I really haven't looked back. So I guess, yeah, that's how I got into it seriously was doing my MLT. I'm kind of the opposite. I was never officially trained. I mean, I was lucky that I grew up in the Rockies. So I guess like the Rockies are so different from Europe when you go hiking because the wilderness is just way more vast and pristine that they're just, it tends to be harder to navigate. So maybe I was exposed, but I mean, most of my friends, if they see me drive or cycle in the city, they're always like, are you really allowed to run across mountain ranges by yourself? You're terrible at this. Cause I cannot navigate a city. Like I'm just like, I lived in Edinburgh for eight years and I still like if you ask me for directions I'm like oh like go down the like the, the one with the red sign and the house and like I'm just I'm terrible in a city but mountains I do find a bit more intuitive but I never I never took a real course I just self-taught which is not what I would recommend to anyone at all like you should learn how to navigate properly but I, I just didn't because I was a cheap student when I started so I was like oh I can just yeah. Do this so I, I do really like technology because that is what I had and was really obvious and easy to me and I've learned how to read a map since and I can map navigate but um I didn't take the course it was just you know the more you go out and practice so like I was asked about the official routes in the UK and which ones I've done and I've done very few of the official routes because I think it's a really good training exercise for me to look at a map and say, right, I want to see these three things. Now I'm going to have to figure out how to go see them rather than just blindly follow a trail. I mean, yeah. we're so lucky in the UK that the big routes that we have, like the West Island way and the Great Glen way and the Penang way, like all the ways and the rounds and all that, we're so lucky to have them. They're really cool. If you want to get into these sports, it's a good place to start, but you need to practice your navigation. And the best way to do that is to just get off of those and and 
pick some challenges and pick some directions and mess it up a few times yeah definitely go with a group of friends and yes go off the beaten path a little bit and see how you get on yeah so since you're the real map one we do have a question just for you which maps do you like best what just that's a very strange question um ordnance survey harvey that's so i tend to use ordnance survey 1 to 25 simply because they give you the most detail um but I can use a 1 to 50 and I've used a Harvey's. I think Harvey's are good for when you kind of know where you're going already, like a good sunny day when you just sort of want to get an overview of where you're going. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not particular about any map. Any map will do. <laughs> you have the same guilty pleasure as me that you just sometimes look at maps when like you should be working and then you just go daydreaming and you end up on like some country that you've not even been to and going like, oh, I wonder what yeah oh yeah there and you just like imagine your bike in your mind going like i bet yeah i could ride that like yes very dangerous thing to do looking at maps got no idea where you might end up that's funny i like it uh we have a question about planning trips whether you spend a lot of time doing research reading books the internet do you just ask people or do you just bombs away and go for it how do you like when you come up in your mind like write emily time for adventure I've booked two weeks off, then what do you do? What's next? So it depends what it is, again, like how much I know about the thing I'm doing. Like if it's a big thing, like going off to Spain and doing some crazy record, then I'll, I've got this sort of framework that I work through of like building out all the, all the logistics and stuff. Um, But for more of a, just, you know, going up to the Lake District or whatever, I'll just, I might not even look too much. I might just go and see, go and see what I want to do when I get up there. Because the weather can be a big deal as well. Like if you've got a set two weeks, like I've spent so much time in Scotland in winter waiting for a weather window. And well, that's just a silly waste of time. You do about it. No, Scotland is just Gore-Tex up and deal with it kind of winter. Yeah. <laughs> just learn to embrace it finally. Mm. Yeah, I kind of, I go between that sometimes I, Sometimes I plan, like if I'm doing something where I know I've raised the bar way beyond my own abilities, then Mm -hmm. having a plan will just give me a little bit of confidence. Like if I've got, if I know that I've researched this to death, then that gives me confidence going into it. But um, I'm a really bad researcher because if I start doing research, I start to get way too excited about the adventure and then I get really like frustrated that I'm not there. So like my next big challenge would be to run across the Caucasus if COVID would let me go do that. Um, and so I'm always asked, how are the plans coming along? And I'm like, I can't start planning that until a week before I leave. Because if I'm planning that right now and it's March and BC since there's snowing outside and like, I'm just gonna get like frustrated that I'm not there. Like I don't, I don't like that planning phase as much as I like the doing. So I prefer to, to just go jump with both feet. Um, I don't know. I just, I think the more confident I get as well with my own abilities, the less planned I am. Cause I'm like, I know it'll be fine. I know how to speak to locals and ask for directions. I know that I know that for sure, whatever plan I make, I will throw it out by day three and things will have changed anyway. So like, I'm just wasting my own time making a plan. So okay. yeah, I'm just, I'm a bit That's more nonchalant about it now. I like to read the books. I really do love, mm-hmm. I mean, so always that's like my phone for me on a trip has so many purposes, you know, it's a camera, it's a diary, it's a phone, it's a GPS. Um, but I always love to have books. So going ultralight, I'll just read books on my phone. I always do try to look for local literature either by a local author or set in a local area or something like that and that I find that really is is a nice thing for me to connect with the place through the culture a little bit especially Mm -hmm. if you're doing like a solo mountain thing where there are going to be plenty of days where you don't engage with the culture because you're in the wilderness yeah Um, I've always liked doing that but so the million dollar question of course you have to answer Emily is what's next uh, I don't know. I don't know. I thought I knew and now I'm completely uncertain about what I'm going to be doing this year. Um, I've got a few ideas of things sort of brewing around, some things involving bagging a lot of mountains, um, some things involving cycling because I haven't done a bike trip in 
couple of years now. <gasps> but I'm afraid I can't commit to anything. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same. I'm, I'm taking this whole, you know, I've found the parallels between living in a pandemic and going on long solo adventures to be just kind of like endless parallels. And one of the big ones on a long solo adventure is it's just really overwhelming to try and look to your finish line sometimes. Yeah. And I have a phrase on my long runs, which is that I can always run a 10K because that's actually a phrase that I just have in my day-to-day -day life. Like that's the level of fitness I like to keep myself on is that I can always run a 10K. So okay. when I'm on these big mountain runs and I know I've got 800 kilometers left and that is a horrible number to think about because you like your legs will just start to wither at the thought of it. Yeah. Um, then I just say, I'm just doing this 10K at a time. Like I'm just going to run 10K and then I'll see what's up when that 10K is done, but I'm not going to think beyond it. Um, so that's kind of my attitude to the world right now is just like week on week, like this week, I hope to do a really big ride ride because it's starting to be bigger daylight hours here in BC. And that's all I have to say. Like, you know, I know that I'd like to do big adventures this summer, but I don't know what worlds I will live in this summer. So at the moment, I'm just like week on week, yeah. just take her as she comes and yeah. live every now and again, I take a dive into a, a whole load of like we we're just talking about a whole load of maps and plan a million things but I've no idea when I'm going to get to do them so. yeah exactly yeah so I'll just I'll break my own heart if I if I look too deep yeah. that stuff. like it does I mean I, I am coping really well but I, I said to a friend the other day she was asking like oh as an adventurer how are you coping and I just said it it feels like I'm in a breakup like it just like I do actually feel a heartache for travel like so I just, that's the level at which I miss it. And I'm okay because I live in a place that I get to ride my bikes every day and I get to go skiing all the time. And like, I'm good. And I'm definitely one of the luckiest people in all this, but mm. yeah, sitting around looking at maps and plans for me right now is just like looking at your ex's photos. Like, <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> so yeah. I can't do that. Um, I just feel like we've been on one extreme solo expedition for this entire past year. Like it's, it's yeah. been really long and really quite quite difficult but yeah really yeah that's exactly how it feels um we do have a question because it's international women's day which women have inspired you oh gosh um i should have thought about this beforehand shouldn't i <laughs> um well, we didn't plant the questions we don't know uh so i think Rather than say one person in particular, I'm going to say lots of little people in little ways, like just, just, there are so many, I don't even know how to say this, like every time anyone just sort of goes and does something like, so I, I run a magazine, um, a women in adventure magazine, and I see so many um, either pitches or just, just people who come into my radar who were doing things out of their comfort zone in a small way. And I just find, I find that really inspiring, you know, that there are actually loads of people doing really great things and they're not necessarily shouting about it loads or, you know, crossing oceans or cycling around the world, but there's this big force of lots of little people doing little things. I think that's, I find that very inspiring. You know what, my answer has always been the exact same. Oh no. I was gonna ask like growing up, who was your role model? And you know what? Who was on TV when we were growing up that looks like us? You know, like mm -hmm. there's still who's on TV that looks like us. So I think I think that was a big thing that motivated me to go from just being someone who adventured to being someone who adventures in a very public way was, mm -hmm. you know, I can sit back and complain that I don't see the female demographic in this world or I could just do something about it and the easiest thing for me to do about it was to just like put my own hand up so exactly. a lot of my motivation is that I lacked the role model but yeah I'm the same as you it's like ordinary women that I've met in my life um especially on the runs that I do like a few of them I did in developing countries where women just don't have anywhere near the level of freedom and rights and things mm -hmm. that I have and I would meet these women and just think they're so incredibly strong and you know I'm the one who gets all this glory because I ran a thousand kilometers across our country but actually like that's just so backwards because their life is is so different um like one example 
I was on the Atlas Mountain Race a year ago. I was cycling around Morocco in a race with like other people. Do you remember that? that? <laughs> I know, different life. Um, and in the middle of the race, and this race was hugely male dominant and I was a leading woman and then I got my period and it was like the worst time to get my period because you can't get a period in North Africa because you can't buy tampons in North Africa. Like they're just, they're not acceptable to the culture so you can't get them. And I wasn't expecting a period, so I wasn't prepared. And it was just this absolute disaster. I'm in, this middle, in the middle of a bike race with all these men and we're competing for only one podium. And I'm thinking, oh. And, um, and it would have been so easy to complain. Like this was discussed, like I just had to like ride through it and just deal with the fact that this was happening. And my heat regulation was way off. Cycling in the desert when you have your period is just not something you ever want to do. Like I was feeling really sick. <laughs> Everything was just gross. And then I just, before I would complain, I would look around me and there were just women the Berber women working outside under the same hot sun that I was trying to work under um, and thinking, well, they've never had a tampon in their whole lives. Like when mm -hmm. they get their periods, this is their life. They don't have different products. They can't talk about it the same way that I feel embarrassed to tell my male competitors who are from like, you know, Germany and America and stuff. I'm embarrassed to tell them what I'm going through. They live in the same, but they live in these conditions and that, to me, I would like look at those women and just without even having a conversation with them, decide I was inspired by their lives because their lives mm -hmm. are just way harder than mine was. And I had no right to complain that I had my period in the middle of an international sporting event because like it just felt like the definition of personal problems at that time. And and I just, yeah, just took so much strength from the women of Morocco <laughs> without yeah. even asking them for it. I was just like, wow. And Gives you a lot of perspective, doesn't it? Yeah, and that always helps, isn't it? Just doing that gratitude, even if you don't feel like, I mean, if I'm on my period, I don't feel like being grateful for anything because I'm really grumpy, but that was that was definitely my coping mechanism was like, just practice some gratitude, have some perspective and yeah. yeah. Um, we've got a question leading on to from the Women's Day topic, um, mm. whether either of us have experienced any sexism or assumptions based on your gender, I will just bang the desk and say yes, yeah. but then let you actually give your full answer yeah so yes definitely but I quite like one not making a deal about it and two just demonstrating that they're completely wrong in their assumptions so I, I kind of like to sort of just quietly be the opposite of what they're expecting and then that like eventually sort of changes their entire perspective of, and they realize they're just being sexist yeah, I think the funny thing with it is that there's more subtle, I mean, it depends on where you are in the world when this is happening, but there's, I think there's a lot of mm. subtle sexism, like this kind of like assumptions that um, this isn't your thing or you've got a boyfriend who's going to come help you or mm. like you're not going to do this at the level of the real athletes because you're a girl, so you're probably just not into that. It's not even outwardly sexist in your face it's just an assumption that yeah. um you know that this isn't a thing that girls like to do that yeah. you know you're you're not going to be okay bivying or sleeping in a tent because you're a girl you probably just want to get to the spa and stuff like that yeah um, I think that's part of the problem I have with the word well people calling me brave is that in some of those situations I actually I hear that as what are you doing here and yeah. that's not necessarily what they mean but that's sometimes how I think I interpret it. Yeah, I remember it. this memory just came to me. I got to the top of a climb in, I want to say Austria, I'm not sure, the top of a hill. And a guy said, are, like, you was just chatting to this guy. And then he kind of looks around and realized my boyfriend hasn't caught up yet and realizes I don't have a boyfriend. And he goes, hang on, are you alone? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, good for you. That's so cool. And then I just looked back at him and said, are you alone? And he went, yeah. And I was like, good for you. Good for you. That's, That's so, so cool. cool. <laughs> like, what? And it's just like, I know we do live on different standards, but like, what? <laughs> yeah. I've had people ask me where my friends are, things like that. That's mm -hmm. a bit awkward. Sorry, I, I don't have any. Is that a problem? <laughs> yeah, I know. And yeah, and you just kind of have these stammering moments where you're trying, like I try to come up with something clever to say about how women are allowed to do stuff on their own now, but it's just, it's so obvious to me that I don't know how to, how to formulate in a way that's not going to make me sound like the raging feminist that everyone runs away from. Although the older I get, the more comfortable I am with being a raging feminist that everyone runs away from. I kind of enjoy okay. that role, if I'm honest. 
Um, that was actually our last question from the audience. So, mm -hmm. but let's just finish with, I wanted to ask you about Intrepid Magazine and what the future is for you in, you know, you're, you've made a career out of lifting other women up and sharing women's stories um, and just asking how that's going and what's next um, for you in that pursuit. Okay. So with Intrepid, we are, we used to be a print magazine a while ago, but obviously that's, that's kind of had to stop. So we're, um, we're going forward as a sort of online newslettery sort of publication. Uh, so it's a weekly, weekly emails. Um, there's going to be monthly like news as much because people say there is, you know, there aren't any women in adventure and you can't find them and all this stuff. So we have a news bulletin once a month with everything we can possibly find that's going on. Please send us stuff. <laughs> um, and then there are going to be articles. I, I really want to champion um, publishing stories that wouldn't necessarily pu be published elsewhere. Um, so typically sort of first person stories by women, kind of, we call it cutting out the middleman, but that sounds like a, a cheesy pun. Um, but yeah, articles yeah. every week um, and some sort of discussion thread things. So again, it's really hard, like Google doesn't help you if you're a small writer or creator or podcaster or whatever. So having places to collect all the podcasts, all the people's websites, all that kind of stuff. We'll be doing doing that as well. But yeah, hoping to grow it as much as we can, spread the word. Yeah, I love seeing that. I think the most important thing we can all be doing right now and something the older I get and the more I travel, the more aware I am of the fact that women, um, the best we can do is to help each other and build each other up. And so I love that you've taken it to the extreme level that you've taken it to and mm -hmm. wish you all the success with growing that. Thank and you. I just want to say thanks a million to all the people who tuned in tonight and happy International Women's Day to all of you. Thanks. Yeah. Good to talk to you.